Good morning, everybody. Good morning, it's JPR, and welcome back to another video. So after eight generations and counting, Pokemon has a cast of characters about as big as The Simpsons. Obviously, many characters have become staples, fan favorites, if you will, but inevitably other characters do get left behind. So here are the characters that you probably forgot about, and most likely Pokemon by extension. The only rule that I'm laying down for this, though, is that you have to have a unique design. You can't just be a generic NPC with a name, like Mr. Pokemon. Pokemon or Rad Rickshaw or something like that. I don't think those characters were really designed with the intent of being remembered. Although I will make an exception for recurring characters, so look out for that. But before that, a word from today's sponsor, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. Of course, the Tokyo Treat Box, as usual, features all the hip and new exclusive Japanese snacks, while the Sakura Ko Box will give you your fix for the more traditional Japanese foods. This month, both boxes are Tsukimi, or moon viewing themed, in celebration of the upcoming Tsukimi festivals. Tokyo Treat's box features a number of Tsukimi-inspired snacks like the Mikan Mochi, Full Moon Pond Crackers, and the Salt Lemon Kit Kats, which I am absolutely in love with right now. Sakura Ko, on the other hand, is celebrating with its Kyoto Moon Festival box. All of these snacks pair excellently with the Sujiri tea that is also included in this month's box. As an added bonus, it even comes with this traditional Japanese tableware. So be sure to celebrate the autumn moon this September the right way with a Tokyo Treat or Sakura Ko box of your very own, using my links in the description down below. Thank you Tokyo Treat and Sakura Ko once again, I can't wait to dig into the rest of these. It's really hard to believe that any character from the Kanto region would be forgotten as often as we revisit this place. And that's why the Kanto character technically isn't even a Kanto character. It's Celio from the Sevi Islands. Celio is only present in one of the three Kanto-based games, those being Fire Red and Leaf Green, but even there, he's easily overshadowed by Bill as the regional storage system developer. He does play a pretty big role in the post-game, though, serving as the character who connects the Kanto and Hoenn regions together, allowing them to trade. You know, just obnoxiously late into the game, preventing you from doing any cool team-building stuff during the main story. No biggie or anything, take your time, Celio. Kanto also has two other closely related characters that Pokemon surprisingly didn't forget about, but I'd be willing to bet that most of you probably don't think about them on a daily basis. And yes, they are technically generic trainer classes, so I'm kind of breaking my own rule here, but when do I not? At the very least, they are recurring characters. The two kings of karate from Saffron City. Koichi and Kyo. Koichi was the former gym leader of the Fighting Dojo back when Saffron City had two gyms, before Sabrina completely cancelled the fighting one. Koichi still stays at the dojo to give away Hitmonlee or Hitmonchan to traveling trainers. Kyo, on the other hand, left the dojo to train to Mount Mortar in Johto, where he'll reward the player with a Tyrogue upon his defeat. He even recently came back in Pokemon Masters EX to fulfill the same role. Surprisingly, both of them even appear in the anime. Kyo made an appearance back in episode 233, A Tyrogue Full of Trouble, and Koichi, despite being a notable character since 1996, only recently made his anime debut in Pokemon Journeys in 2020, where he oversaw a battle between Ash and B. The King of Karate also reappears in Pokemon X and Y, stating that he wants to make a new fighting dojo in Lumio City, but since they both call themselves that, it's not clear whether this is Koichi or Kyo. Either way, I was genuinely surprised just how much spotlight these two relatively unknown characters receive. As for Johto, if we're not counting Kyo, there is Carrie who exclusively appears in Gen 2, and yes, she does have her own unique design in Pokemon Stadium too, so it counts. If you don't know about Carrie, she's a girl who appears in the Goldenrod department store, who will unlock the mystery gift option for you. If your last mystery gift came from her, then you could battle Carrie in the Viridian City Trainer House, where she would use any of three random teams. She is the only trainer in all of Gen 2 to use Heracross, Caesar, Porygon 2, Stantler, and Gligar, because, you know, just Gen 2 things. Not like Heracross had two different Johto gyms he could have appeared in or anything, right? Ha 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 ha. But of course, like every trainer that uses the trainer house in Gen 2, Carrie will instead use Ethan's sprite instead of her own, so naturally she's a little forgettable, despite being the literal parent of Mystery Gift. For both Kanto and Johto though, Primo exists as a remake exclusive character. In Fire Red Leaf Green, Primo is the star of the Tichi TV show where the player can get tutorials in the way of Pokemon battling. In HeartGold and Soul Silver, Primo can be found in the Violet City Pokemon Center where he'll give away secret box wallpapers and eggs if you tell him a certain combination of words. The eggs he gives away contain Mareep, Wooper, and uh, what was the name of that third Pokemon? Oh, uh, Slugma you say? Slugma nuts, ha, huh? got him! 
<laughs> yeah, but uh, you should really just go for Slugma, since this is the only way to get it inside of the Johto region. Mareep and Wooper are literally catchable on the next route, so don't even waste your time. Primo can later be encountered as an opponent to the Pokeathlon Dome in the Supreme Cup. In the stands, his younger twin brother Maximo can be found giving advice about the various Pokeathlon courses. He also hosts a radio show similar to his older brother who is on TV, though despite being the younger brother, his radio nickname is The Big Brother. Everyone's got an ego to fill, I guess. The Hoenn region is filled with all kinds of characters that have been lost to time, like Scott from Emerald. Despite not being a trainer, he's a decently important character as the founder of the Battle Frontier. Of course, since the Battle Frontier doesn't exist yet in Oras, there's no reason for Scott to be there, although he is mentioned in passing by an NPC who says he's found the future Pike Queen for Scott, alluding to Frontier Brain Lucy. Of course, Scott is mostly remembered for his time in the anime, where he largely plays the same role, but appears much more frequently than he does in the games. At the end of the Advanced series, he offers Ash a chance to become a Frontier Brain himself, but of course, Ash ultimately turns him down. Not gonna lie, I kinda wish there was a super boss battle against Scott at the end of Emerald when you've collected all the Frontier symbols. That would've been pretty tight! Just this chill-looking dude in shades and a Hawaiian shirt casually being the game's strongest trainer? Speaking of the long-lost Battle Frontier, though, only a few of the original Frontier brains have maintained some level of relevancy. Of course, there's Lucy, who we mentioned earlier. She got a nod in Oras, and also just kinda randomly got dropped in Pokemon Masters out of nowhere. Noland is the only other Hoenn Frontier brain who made it into Masters, and of course, he's well-remembered for using an Articuno against Ash's Charizard in the anime. Annabelle, of course, makes a reappearance in the Alola region games, playing a very large role in Sun and Moon's postgame. And Brandon also gets a small mention in Oras, though one that you have to go out of your way for. In Mauville TV, it's revealed that before becoming a Frontier Brain, Brandon is a world traveler who stars in a TV show about hunting legendary and mythical Pokémon. And of course, he's an incredibly important character in the anime, serving as the final Frontier Brain, one of the few characters to have caught legendary Pokémon, and the driving force behind Paul's development in the Diamond and Pearl series. So that leaves these three as our forgotten ones. Quick, without googling it, tell me his name right now! Yeah, I didn't think so. It's Spencer. Honestly, he kinda has an awesome design, and I really wish he were an active character in Hoenn's main story. Apparently in the manga, he once touched the blue orb, giving him visions of Kyogre, but that's about it. The other two are Greta and Tucker, and if you didn't watch the anime, then there's little reason to know anything about them. Heck, even if you did watch the anime, they only appear in one episode each pretty early on in the Frontier arc, so they aren't particularly well fleshed out there either. Hoenn even has a gym leader who remains relatively forgotten. Wallace's replacement in Emerald, Juan. And when I say replacement, I mean it, like basically the same character, but slightly older. He's a coordinator in the anime, like Wallace, and he even uses the same gym leader team as Wallace, except replaces Milotic with Kingdra. You know, a non-Hoenn ace that he shares with the previous region's final gym leader. He's not yet been added at Pokemon Masters, and even in Oras, he doesn't appear. He is mentioned by Lizia to be Wallace's mentor, but literally as her final line of dialogue in the game. Frankly, I'm surprised Game Freak even remembered to bring him back for the World Championships in Black 2 and White 2. That was Juan's last appearance, now a full decade ago. Sinnoh features a number of trainers that will join you in your journey, known as the Stat Trainers since they all specialize in a certain stat. Yeah, pretty straightforward explanation there. Cheryl and Marley are pretty well-known ones you can't miss, and they also appear in Pokémon Masters. Riley and Buck both have Team Galactic plots associated with them, and their stories are required if you want to get Riolu and Heatran respectively. But Mira kinda sticks out as the forgotten one. She only accompanies you for the first floor of Wayward Cave, and you actually have to go out of your way to find her first, unlike the other trainers who join you at the beginning of the area. Her quest is completely skippable, especially in Platinum where you can instantly go to the basement to catch Gibble. Because who would help a small frightened child in a cave if there wasn't something in it for them? Not me! Her ace Pokémon being Kadabra, or later Alakazam, also doesn't help since that's about as common as a psychic type ace gets. Legends Arceus at least seems to imply that Mira's bloodline is related to Nurse Joy's, but even her ancestor is very easy to miss compared to other ancestors in the game. Overall, just a really easy character to forget about. Additionally, like Hoenn, Sinnoh has a fair number of easily forgotten frontier brains. Sinnoh never received a Battle Frontier arc in the anime, so these ones are substantially less remembered 
remembered, despite appearing in both Platinum and the Johto remakes. Of course, Palmer is easy to remember as Barry's dad, and he also appears in Diamond and Pearl as well as their remakes, and Thornton and Duroc at least got into Pokemon Masters, but as of recording this video, Argenta and Dahlia are still missing in action. Even Duroc is often overshadowed at the Battle Castle, since most people seem to remember Caitlyn more for later becoming a Unova Elite 4 member. Poor Duroc doesn't even get his battle sprite to himself, he has to share it with Caitlyn. And of course, k is another Platinum exclusive character. He was introduced alongside Looker in the main story, but unlike Looker, he has not had the luxury of multiple appearances. He's actually the fourth commander of Team Galactic, but all mention of him is completely cut in the remakes. Even in the Platinum exclusive Team Galactic wallpaper, he gets replaced with a generic Galactic Grunt. At the very least, it's very hard to miss his ancestor Koi in Legends Arceus, who resides in Jubilife Village. Jumping into Gen 5 though, Benga was an odd addition of a character. He is Alder's grandson and only appears in the post-game of Black 2 and White 2. He has no anime appearances and has not yet been added into Pokemon Masters, which is kind of surprising because he is a pretty powerful trainer in-game. Owning either Latios or Latias, and also gives the player a shiny Dratini or Gibble depending on the version. So, he's definitely significant, he was just put in the game at the most awkward of times. Yancey and Curtis are another pair of relatively unknown Gen 5 characters, appearing in a lengthy side quest involving a lost X transceiver Perhaps even stranger than that, it later develops into a subtle romance subplot? As Curtis will only appear if the player is female, and Yancey if the player is male. Definitely a strange development for a Pokemon game, but at least it later unlocks some cool trades where you can get some rare foreign Pokemon from them, ranging from Togepi all the way up to stuff like Spiritomb and Snorlax. They all have hidden abilities too, so it's definitely a worthwhile side quest, even if it is a long one. Kalos doesn't have as many significant characters as past regions, so it's a little harder to choose from. I would have probably said Emma if she didn't get that episode of Pokemon Generations devoted to her a few years back. Bonnie is pretty forgettable in-game for a unique character design, but obviously she has more than enough attention given to her in the anime. So, I don't know, probably the Team Flare scientists? Pokemon hasn't really done anything with them since Gen 6 ended. I mean, I guess they'll probably appear in Pokemon Masters at some point as part of the villain arc, but they're just kind of like less important versions of the Galactic Commanders. In Alola, I'd say it's probably Ryuki. In regular Sun and Moon, Ryuki is a completely random Dragon-type trainer who will challenge you for the title of Champion in the postgame. There were a lot of theories about Ryuki back in the day heading into Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Like, maybe he would be a Dragon Gym Leader. For context, this was back when the leading theory for the Ultra Games was that gyms would replace Trials. I mean, they were kinda right, he's like the most important trainer in that weird Spongebob gym. Ryuki is a bit like the Karate Kings in my mind. He's a pretty obscure character that has been treated surprisingly well. He did get his anime appearance back in Sun and Moon, and he may be in NPC jail at the moment in Pokemon Masters, but hey, at least he's in the game. Way before a lot of other important characters, too. It's just funny that for such a uniquely designed character, he's entirely missable in both pairs of Alola games. I'd also like to take a moment to highlight the Ultra Recon Squad, because boy, you'd think that a race of actual alien people wouldn't be so quickly forgotten about. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, they are. Pretty much the only mention of them since 2017 has been in Pokemon Go of all places, where a new member named Rai assists the player in finding the Ultra Beast. And in the Galar region, I'd say the most easily forgotten character is Mustard's wife, Honey. She actually is decently important in the Isle of Armor, but most people probably don't even know that. If the player donates 1 million watts to the dojo, they'll unlock a secret final battle against Honey. She technically isn't THE super boss of the game, since her husband Mustard is still about 5 levels stronger, but definitely one of the game's hardest challenges, topping out at level 75. But the challenge of that battle is nothing compared to the challenge of getting her rare League card, which requires 3,280,000 watts donated. I don't know why it's that oddly specific number, but it's still one thing that I doubt most people have reached. Perhaps I should have added this to my list of rare events from a few weeks ago. So what do you think? Did I forget any forgotten characters? Boy, that would be quite fitting, wouldn't it? Shout out to my newest channel member, Youngster Skamore. Thank you so much for your support, and thank you for subscribing for future videos just like this one. I'll see you guys next time.